Great. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, this is the ICOM Canada webinar, Repatriation in Three Acts. Um, and uh, welcome uh, especially to Patricia Allen, who is the Curator of World Cultures at Glasgow Museums. Um, and she is going to talk about her experiences in the repatriation of artifacts from Nigeria, uh, Benin, India, and um, is it so it's South Dakota, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Cheyenne River, River and Pine Ridge Nations. Um, so Patricia and I have known each other for uh, a long time. Um, I was just uh, trying to figure out how long we've known each other. and We met each other in Ecuador 38 years ago. <laughs> Believe it or not, uh, we were both on an archaeological dig in Ecuador, and uh, Patricia was actually my boss at the time. Um, and uh, so uh, we lost touch for a while, and then we got back in touch, and um, we both found it interesting that we had uh, sort of um, somehow kind of slid into the same kind of career. <laughs> Not exactly the same. I think your career is better than mine, Pat. <laughs> but, um, but similar in museums. Uh, so Pat's been the curator of world culture since 2002. Her responsibilities cover non-European art and history and include Africa, Oceania, uh, the Pacific regions, um, the Americas, the Caribbean, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Pat uh, has an honors degree in biology from the University of Aberdeen, a master's degree in archaeology and anthropology, and a postgraduate certificate in education from the University of Sheffield. She has worked on archaeological sites throughout the world as an ethnobotanist, principally on the south coast of Ecuador, where she was field director and environmentalist for a multidisciplinary research project and museum. Pat's research interests include international repatriation, indigenous cultures and heritage, post and pre-colonial art and history and contemporary folk and tribal art of Northern India and South America. Um, and uh, I think I'm not gonna read all the rest of this. It's a lot of stuff, um, but uh, suffice to say that uh, Pat has done field research in many different places and I uh, can speak knowledgeably uh, about all of the, the um, objects in the, her collection. And she's going to talk about repatriation. Um, please go ahead, Pat. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I don't think I could say much more about my life, um, but I do have a wood burner. <laughs> and I've, I've delayed you slightly because of waiting, I was waiting for a man with firewood. Um, I live in the north of Scotland these days, which is cold. In fact, you know, I'm sure you all understand what it's like to be cold and to have wood burners and have to wait for, for a woodsman to turn up with van loads of firewood. But, um, so that's how I've been spending my day, not at all about all the many things that Elka has read out. Um, so yeah, Elka and I have known each other for, as it turns out, for these 38 years. And some of you, I guess, presumably some of you were not even born when we first met. Um, I can't see any of you, so I, I don't know what I'm looking. I don't know who's out there. Anyway, um, I would like to make my webinar, my talk, more of a discussion, if possible. So I want to leave some time for for comments and discussion at the end because we call it repatriation in English English. So I'll just keep on doing that. Um, we'll have a slide into repatriation at the end of the discussion. It's uh, I'll have, my my accent will have slipped. Um, so repatriation is a hugely complex um, sort of process, really, and it's so many different factors involved. It's all about people as well, and people are complex and different. And we're just learning. Um, even though I've been doing this for 20 years, I'm still learning. And uh, I'm always interested in other people's experiences. Um, so I'm hoping that we can do some sharing at some point at the end. Um, so I, I work for Glasgow Museums, which is it's a museum service. It's run by the City Council and it's we're an arm's length organisation called Glasgow Life. And Glasgow Life is the culture and leisure arm, so it includes sports and arts and museums and libraries. Um, but the collections themselves are owned by the City Council, which is just a whole other layer of bureaucracy. And governance is one of the things I'm going to mention, right, which is an, another factor in the complexity of repatriation. So this image, um, could we have the next slide, please? 
right? That image was of Kelvin Grove Museum, uh, which is our flagship. And so the background to all of this is that, first of all, there's a difference between English and, Scot and Scots law. So um, the situation as, a, as it applies in England is quite, and Wales is quite different from that with, of Scotland. Um, and uh, we don't really have anything either in England, nor Scotland, nor Wales, I suppose, nor Ireland, um, that are actually refers in law to, to Scottish, uh, to repatriation. And the guidelines that we do have, which are not procedures, which is not a law, they are currently apply only to human remains. Artifacts are governed by Scots property law in the sense that the museum holding requested material has the legal right of ownership and can do what you like. You can do what you like with objects, really. And however, there is, as I say, said, no law governing repatriation. So cases have to be decided on ethical principles alone by each individual institution. And the final decisions are generally made by the by museum's governing bodies. So now I'll have the next slide, Sarah. Okay, but what's coming out in the press and our managers interviews at the moment and our politicians interviews that is that Glasgow is just doing so well. <laughs> Scotland is doing wonderfully with, every, with everything and repatriation in particular, particularly Glasgow. It is true that Glasgow is the first Scottish city to agree to international repatriation from its museums. It's actually one of the first in the UK. And we started in 1990 with ancestral human remains. And uh, that came from the Australian human rights activist, Michael Mansell. And we returned some human, human remains to the Mount Morgan community of Queensland. And then the first cultural artifact to be repatriated from the UK, from a UK museum, what well, happened in 1998, and it was the Lakota Ghost Dance shirt, which was returned to the Wounded Knee Survivors Association of Cheyenne River. Next slide. Okay, uh, could we go back one, please, Sarah? Can we go back, please? Or is this right? There was a, yeah. The current situation is that we agreed, Glasgow City Council agreed to establish a repatriation of artifacts working group. Now, a repatriation of artifacts working group was set up in response to the Lakota Ghost Dance shirt return because there were a couple of, re, of requests at the time. And also, the Ghost Dance shirt had to go through a number of appeals after being rejected a couple of times. And so back in 1998, the uh, um, Glasgow City Council set up a repatriation of artifacts working group. And uh, in order to, I suppose, come to a conclusion, which was held at a hearing with the Wounded Knee Survivors Association of Cheyenne River as to the fate of the Lakota ghost dance shirt. So that um, working group only convened when there was a request for repatriation. And in fact, the last request was in 2010. City councillors are elected to post every three years. And so when I approached them in order to suggest that we might consider working with Benin um, and actually taking the initiative, it turned out that the current councillors had no idea that they'd even, they even owned the collections. And so the question, they didn't even understand, so they didn't understand the question. Um, and so with management, we got the council to re-establish the working group which so it's always going to be sitting as part of the constitution now so we we all requests have to fulfill the criteria listed there so that's the status of those making the request the continuity between the community that created the objects or or descendants of the ancestors and the current community on behalf whose behalf the request is made the cultural, historical, and or, or religious importance of the objects or ancestors to this descendant community, and to a lesser extent, how the objects and or ancestors were acquired by the museum. There was a fifth criterion, which was applied to the, the ghost dance shirt that went back in 1998, which was um, the fate of the objects if returned. The, the result of which was that the ghost dance shirt went back, had to go back to a museum. So it didn't actually go back to Cheyenne River, it went to a museum in Pur, which is a, a, a town 90 uh, miles away from the nearest um, sort of reservation. 
Um, so I fought quite hard for that to be removed. It isn't, you know, um, Aberdeen had already taken, taken initiative on that. Um, and so we removed that and that makes, to a certain extent, the fourth criterion less important because uh, if somebody can prove that they've owned or have the right to claim for an object, it doesn't really matter how we got it. If it was sacred to them, that's the most important thing. Next slide, please. So, so as a result of that, this April, 27th of April, 2022, this, the new City Council's Repatriation of Artifacts Working Group accepted and approved three requests that were um, sent in on the 28th of January. So these were, I've kind of, as I say, it's in three acts. Um, there is no chronology here, right? So, but um, I think I'm putting this maybe in the order in which the, the, the uh, requests came in, but they all came in within about three days of each other. So the National Commission of Museums and Monuments, Nigeria, who is working on behalf of the Royal Court of Benin, is one. Um, the Cheyenne River and Oglala Lakota Sioux tribes of South Dakota, USA, they were largely uh, a family, the descendants of a, um, an activist called Marcella Lebeau, um, who died in November. And uh, so um, it's her children and grandchildren who are leading on this, but there are others, there are elders involved as well. And, uh, and also the, the Cheyenne River and um, spiritual leader um, who has approved all of this and yeah so there's there's always elders in the background um, with the Lakota and the third one is the High Commi uh, Commission of India who were requesting items on behalf of the Archaeological Survey of India uh, aka the government of India. Um, next slide. Right okay I'm going to talk to a little about these I'm not going to list verbally all of the objects, all of the objects are going back because there's 51 objects in total came out of that, those three requests, um, which is uh, sort of quite a lot, really. It's, probably, it's certainly unprecedented in Scotland. It will soon be overtaken by the bigger English museums who are giving material back to Benin and they have bigger collections, so there you go. Right, so in Nigeria, that's Benin. So that was um, uh, the story behind that really was that I was at a conference, Commonwealth Association Museum conference back in 2019. It was a decolonization conference and there was a presentation from a member of the of staff of the NCMM who talked in her presentation, talked about repatriation to Benin. And I, I was aware that there was interest um, this interest arose from the Black Lives Matter um, movement. And so there's a great focus on Benin and African repatriation. Benin is an obvious one because there was a punitive expedition. The city was looted and everything, you know, the, the contents be, the, were taken and sold um, in order to pay for the expedition, which was normal practice for the British at that time. So mm -hmm. uh, this is how this whole thing started. And... Um, and mm -hmm. sorry, it's the forward man. Sorry. I'm just going to leave him. <laughs> I've never met him before tonight, so uh, he's delivered the forward. I've no, and I've given him this money. <laughs> so anyway, so um, this led basically to the reestablishment of the repatriation working group and I use this Benin as an example because it's literally everybody had heard of it pretty much except actually as it turned out the councillors who all thought who all had to google Benin and came up with the Republic of Benin. Um, so we'd identified, I'd identified rather 19 objects within the collection from Nigeria that that were related to the either directly to the punitive expedition um, or were associated with the royal palaces in some way from that period. And I can say this because some of our collection came from uh, the, the Wellcome Trust, the Henry Wellcome was a collector who, who disposed of a lot of his collection in the late 19, in the 1940s and didn't, a lot of this didn't come with, main, with records. Um, but we've actually, but we've identified a couple of these kind of directly, but the style also the, the um, of each of the pieces reflects that era. 
So we have 19 objects going back, including the heads of the Oba, which of, of previous Obas, which are sacred, their ancestors' heads. Um, next slide. So the outcome of that was that um, they put the re request in and then nothing. This is one of the issues, right? So we managed to get, uh, there's a lot of people are quite keen for someone to say yes, but they're not very keen to actually, I have found after all the, after these many years that some that if you're going to do something like this, the onus is on, on the, the institution. And so a lot of things take a long time because everyone hangs back. So I had to work quite hard, I suppose, a lot endlessly chasing them up. And they finally came to Glasgow, two of them. So that's the director of NCMM, Professor Abatijani, and his lawyer, who is the man on the steps. And I feel that this was a, I think the, <laughs> it's a slightly unfortunate photo because I'm a curator, not a manager. And I do look like I'm the director of the museum or the queen inviting um, Babatundi Adibai, who is the lawyer who had gone missing, actually, this is the problem here. He, we lost him because he decided he was a great fan of latte. He still is, I would imagine, and had decided to enjoy a number of lattes in Glasgow before he turned up. So we were all very relieved to see him. I was just being relieved, not queenly. So this was the meeting. This is the first meeting, and there will be many more. Um, Benin, Nigeria does not have the capacity to take physically retake re back all of the objects that are currently being offered to them. There are hundreds from all over the world. We didn't get very far at that meeting, but we will, we're about to try and convene a second one. It's possible that um, as an alternative to immediate physical re repatriation or physical return, we will um, keep the objects on loan from them. So we'll transfer the ownership, but we'll keep the objects on loan. And I don't know what any of you think of this, we're not, we don't have the resources to do what the Smithsonian's doing, which is to make copies of everything. Um, but I think, you know, um, a return, a loan from them to us is an alternative. As I said, I'm interested in, in what you think about that particular option. Next slide. Okay, it, there are fewer objects from India. India, now India was interesting. So seven antiquities. From this is only a few again. Um, I'll give you the link to all of the collections that are all the material that's going back at the end. It's in the last slide. So um, there were three um, of sort of uh, pillars from a temple in Kampur, which I actually managed to identify um, with the help of our archivists and special collections. I mean, provenancing is hugely important in all of these cases, and that took a bit of work, but we've got the story there. Three of them came from a, a temple, uh, the monsoon temple in Kampur. Um, and that, that is the second, that's the, the pillar that's shown there is one of them. Um, there was a stele, as you could, the stream left um, from Bihar, um, from a village, um, just that's what is, yeah, outside what is now Dinapur, and is no longer probably a village anymore. It's, it, Dinapur has been absorbed into Patna. So we are talking about a megapolis. So this is a shrine of Surya, the sun god. Um, then we have another, another relief um, a deity in, carved in sandstone, which is proving to be quite interesting in that it was dismissed by the victim DNA as being of no interest, but it was causing a lot of interest from the Indian High Commissioner, the acting High Commissioner who came to look at it. And also um, a student I'm about to have um, visit who is um, a specialist in medieval architecture who, think, who is also interested in this particular piece. Now that is the top right hand one who could be um, it was down as being Durga, but it's more likely to be Kali. Um, it was acquired somewhere, or it came from Kolkata, but it may actually also have been from Assam and it may have just been shipped from Kolkata. So we don't know enough yet. So I'm allowed to, uh, because it's going back to the Archaeological Sur Survey of India, I can continue researching these pieces and I will. Um, so there was another small sort of internal pillar that's just uh, made of marble with inlay, which I can't show because it takes terrible photos. 
And but when you see it in real life, it's beautiful. And I think that strikes a note with myself and possibly um, <laughs> we're all much more beautiful on the inside, I think. Um, but it's beautiful. This is it, it's very dirty and it would have been white marble. And it's inlaid with turquoise and other precious stones. And it became so I, it came from a palace within Gwalior Fort in Madhya Pradesh. And the, the, the most ornate palace within that fort was the Manmandir Palace, and that dates to the, the 15th century. So we think it's that one. And at the bottom, we have a, a serpentine sword, a tulwar, um, which uh, was stolen from the Nizam of Hyderabad um, in 1905. So all of, none of these items came from battlefields or anything like that. They were, they were stolen or looted. But you know the, the pillars, the sandstone pillars, were looted um, basically in an, as a result of sort of um, archaeological vandalism. Um, and the others, of course, interesting stories that are quite long. Right? <laughs> the the steely we, we came with a full confession from the from the the um, the thief. So which went on for several pages, but he really you know. But so I won't go into that. I'm happy to correspond with anyone who wants the stories. But uh, so they were all stolen by individuals, um, which is something that happened all over all over the empire. It was very, obviously Egypt is that was a you know, a hotbed of, of, of theft. Um, but here we have it in India. So we can have the next slide, please. Okay, so, well, this is the, the one that has actually happened. Friday, 19th of August, the ownership of the seven items that um, were being repatriated to India were transferred from Glasgow City Council to the Archaeological Survey of India. And I will have to say that we've heard nothing from them since it's got endless emails. It's like they wanted what they've got there. Um, and we are very all ready and prepared to send them back. But we, uh, they, in this instance, and the cost is something I'll come to, in this instance, the, um, the Indian government offered to pay. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a very political a sort of national politics involved here. And this is, I think we were talking about trade deals between countries rather than a situation with museums as being the motivation. But they've offered to pay and we need them to approve a tender that they haven't got back to us. So we're, we still have the objects, they're in limbo, but they don't, own, they don't belong to us anymore. Um, next slide, please. Next one. Okay, the Oseta, I can't pronounce this, um, but this is the Cheyenne River and Lalas Lakota Sioux tribes of South Dakota, USA. Now they sent in an, not a very detailed report requesting um, 25 objects, um, for which in the sense that two moccasins are two objects, um, came from, or purported to have come from um, the, the site of the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. So that is, the, the, I put those up there. So there's a, the cradle cover, a cradle board cover, a, uh, a warrior's bandolier made of, of deer hooves and jingles, and um, a pair of moccasins that were said to belong to uh, across the room, who was said to have been, who was actually the nephew of, of uh, Spotted Elk who did die at Wounded Knee, although across the room himself didn't. Um, the rest of the objects were, they all belonged to named, and they were either sacred in their own right, like the pipes, or they belonged to named individuals, ancestors. Um, so there's an example of three there. They had been following the repatriation of the ghost dance shirt. Um, I can't talk a, lot, a bit about this because it's in the past. There's certain, certain, some of these things I can't talk about because they're basically not my story to tell, if you like. Um, but the original request had been for all of the material that came from the, back, the, the massacre site at Wounded Knee. But at the last minute, just as they were going into a public hearing that was held in November 1998 in Glasgow, um, the Wounded Knee Survivors Association of Cheyenne River's lawyer told them to drop everything except the ghost dance shirt. So they did not request those at the time. Now, Marcella Bilobo 
it was the secretary of the Wounded Knees Survivors Association, not the chair or anybody else. And she wasn't an elder at the time. So um, she just had to go along with it, but they, she questioned, questioned it for a long time, for 20, the subsequent 20 odd years actually. And I was trying to work with her. That's one of the reasons, I suppose the driver behind me trying to change the system at the council level was to help this through. So, you know, um, Marcella was also a, um, re requested separately the return of the waistcoat and the top left hand corner. That waistcoat was said to have belonged to her great grandfather, Rain in the Face. And it was, it was that uh, request was, was rejected twice by management. Um, and um, the shield cover belonged to, I think it was Short Bull, who is um, uh, performed at uh, Buffalo Bills um, Wild West show in Glasgow. Um, and that will lead me on to telling you where these objects came from, which is that they all came from somebody called George Crager, who was the Lakota interpreter for the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. Following the massacre, um, the other warriors were rounded up and um, people who were fighting and didn't die and were not part of, not at Wounded Knee, in Wounded Knee Creek itself. And they were arrested and sent along to Fort Worth. And they a lot of them had already worked with Buffalo Bill. And he, he often recruited. So he was allowed to go along and offered, he was allowed to offer them freedom if they went to on his European tour. So 25 Lakota went with them. And then had to spend the next year reenacting Wounded Knee for the public. So um, it's worth, if you want to see what, what trauma looks like, um, physically, you can see people like, um, you know, Killing Bear and, and Short Bull and how they changed in the course of the year. Um, so, um, having to do that. So it, it must have been awful for them. And Short Bill, who made that um, that shield while he was on the tour, it is a proper shield. Has It has figures on the back as well. It's a canvas shield, but it's, you know, so it is a, a ceremonial shield. Um, and he must, he made that presumably while he was, he was on the tour because it would have protected him. You know, so it protected him from all the, you know, sort of, you know, the, just the horribleness that they were going through at the time. I mean, I presume you all know um, if that, the situation with Wounded Knee, um, you know, that um, it's not part of what's going on exactly now. It's a separate talk, really. I have talked about this quite often. Um, so, um, you know, but if you want to, I can answer questions on that if you like, but anyone who's not familiar, with the story, Bury My Heart in Wounded Knee is I can, uh, the first book that even pops into my head. And if I can, I could rummage in my bookshelves and bring out what something that I wrote and published, uh, but I'm not, I'm not promoting my, my works. Um, but uh, so, so this is a long and complicated story that went on for a very long time, 20 years. And I've known Marcella for most of that time. Um, and I worked really hard. We to, one of the things I tried to do was identify the waistcoat because there's actually turned out there was no proof that it was his um <laughs> thank you very much ruth <laughs> actually we'll do that later we run out of time right <laughs> i'll send you some links if you want to read anything my uh my my work on the ghost stand shirt might was a, a book a chapter in a book is now out of date because i did change everything and um, and of course everything is going back now. So the whole of George George Crager in Glasgow gave twenty eight objects and sold another twenty eight object. No, it's a total of twenty objects. Sold gave fourteen and sold fourteen to Glasgow museums while he was there. Include and so this was his collection, so to speak. The trouble is when I think if the objects were said to belong to people is that he was a little bit, he had been a journalist and, um, and like a lot of people, a lot of, of, of collectors who tried to sell objects or give objects to museums, you would try and kind of put a gloss on them and sometimes, but, and we can't really trust Crager. He was not particularly trustworthy. If there's any, I mean, he's got a large um, family of descendants and I apologize if there's any in the audience, but uh, you know, he's your ancestor, he's not your, you know, 
um, and their insurance. But um, yeah, so we're not sure that all of the, the named people were actually those people. Um, but uh, all of the people who were named were in fact, had um, performed the Buffalo Bill and Crager was quite closely associated um, with Buffalo Bill. So it's quite likely now as time goes on, I, I'm more and more inclined to believe that that the name, those people that he named were the people who owned those uh, those pieces, but the waistcoat was a bit tricky actually, and that was a that was difficult. I couldn't find any Im images at all of Rain in the Face wearing any weight waistcoats at all, but there were two, there are two or three images of Crager with that waistcoat, and there's an uh, there's there are a couple of photographs of um, another uh, officer, army officer, wearing practically all of the collection that we later acquired, including the waistcoat. So that wasn't very helpful, but we did, it, I did eventually find in the archive, in a, a photographic archive, not um, rain in the face wearing waistcoats, but proof that those that style of waistcoat, it's got uh, on the back, I've only got that one photograph, on the back it's got um, uh, two flags and, and definitely Sioux patterns on, but yeah, so they were definitely, so I did find people of that time wearing waistcoats of that style, um, but by this time I had managed to loosen up, if you like, had softened up Glasgow City Council enough for them to have their objects back. These are all that belong to their ancestors. Um, so, um, you know, I felt that it's important that they had them back and it was, you know, so there we go. Um, there are still, we have, you know, this is going to be a slow process. We're working not only with the Lebeau family, uh, who are in, who are mostly in Cheyenne River, with one cousin in Pine Ridge. We're also working with elders in both um, Pine Ridge and Cheyenne River, and some of them sometimes they come and sometimes they don't. And uh, so there's obviously a lot of discussion, and of course, you know, things happen in people's lives that make it difficult. Um, to actually kind of continue with work like this. We're taught, you know, with Nigeria and with India, we're taught, we're, uh, we're, I'm working with governments and great big institutions. This is a family and two, um, two reservations who have got really limited resources, but they're, you know, they do have the advantage of, you know, having a personal connection of really wanting this, but they don't always, they can't, they, they can't you know, life gets in the way sometimes. As um, as my firewood man, that's a good. I lived that exact in that exact sentence at the beginning of this talk. Um, so can we have the next slide, please? All right. Okay. Here's our, I'm nearly finished with the slides. I'm hoping that you can. Uh, I'm going to answer all your questions and you can give me some useful tips. Um, so these are links that are that might give some background. So the first is our new policy on repatriation and spoliation. Um, so spoliation re re uh, refers, if you don't know this, um, it refers to Nazi loot, really. So it's a completely separate process. Uh, and it's, um, in fact, so I have nothing to do with the spoliation element of it. But it's mostly fine art that was, that was uh, looted by the Nazis during the Second World War and the original owners claiming either the, the works back or mostly their value. So that actually, we, so our, repat, our um, policy on, on spoliation is really the spoliation committee, which is a national committee. So it's just a link to that. Um, now, what I will say, I'm gonna add this in right here. Um, there's, we have the care of, um, but I'll, first of all, I'll point out the guidelines for the care of human remains in Scottish museums collections, which are the only guidelines we have at all to anything. Uh, relating to the government. Um, and we have got um, every, uh, a potential Indigenous repatriation. I cannot really go into very much detail about it in terms of where it is. It's a Scottish bog body, which, um, and this is going, this is what I'm working on at the moment. Um, it is, it comes under Scottish archaeology, not my remit. Um, but since I've been doing the repatriations, I'm mentoring the curator. Um, so that is quite interesting. Um, can what be sent to the email, Ruth? 
Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. You can explain with your voice, actually. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, the links. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the person, Elka, you have the whole presentation. You could just cut and paste the links. And also, I haven't put this up, but uh, you can share my email address to people who want to ask more questions. Um, I'm happy to com to uh, to you know continue and communicate with people. Um, so um, yeah, so the Scottish one is interesting, um, and it's interesting to see the what happens when something that seemed very far away, right, on the other side of the world, suddenly come home because <laughs> yes, the um, a lot of our members of staff who are just saying everything should go back. Yes, we, you know, we were terrible, you know, um, during the, the, uh, uh, trying to decolonize, we must give everything back. And then when it comes to something that's actually very close to home from within Scotland, it was, oh no, we can't do that because um, we need to research these, this person. Um, so this is interesting, um, but some of the criteria don't really apply to a Scottish situation, the, the you know, the, um, the first criteria where you have to sort of prove who, you know, basically your um, the right to claim, you know, your connection, because obviously when we're talking about, you know, it's very unlikely that someone could prove a direct relationship these days with someone who, who died in Scotland several hundred years ago, unless they had a family tree, which in this case they don't. Um, so, you know, so. Um, there's lots of issues. Most of it, mostly archaeology, also involves uh, um, ex excavation, and um, it could turn up side down uh, British archaeology if this goes ahead. So, uh, I was an archaeologist. Elka was an archaeologist. Um, I think we've we've kind of come to terms with that, <laughs> and actually we assessed how you know behaviors and attitudes. Oh, that ourselves we managed to do it but um i don't think i think most archaeologists just feel themselves in that they're in a special bubble of you know and that what they're doing is somehow science which <laughs> is so um and i'm if there are archaeologists in there who disagree with the idea of returning archaeological human remains um i'm happy to discuss that as well um so the third link there are the links to the exhibitions, which I just looked at. I'm going to have to try and edit the text a little bit of, uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, all of the, um, they're not really exhibitions. This is what our documentation team calls a group of, uh, when you put a number of records together on one page on the website. Um, bless them. And um, so, but all of the, all of everything that's going back is listed up there. And there's a little piece about the ghost stamp shirt as well, because it was a repatriation as well. Um, so that gives you far more detail uh, for all of these and some of the stories, I think, of the individual um, background. Um, it's gone into some detail with it in, on the link in the links. Um, and the next slide. This is the last slide. OK, well, I couldn't do I've done any of this without Marcella Libro. So this whole talk and everything I do with repatriation, I think, is now in memory of her. And um, there she was. She it was 102 when she died in November. And that was a, quite a recent photograph taken just before she died. So thank you, everybody. I'm open for questions. Um, Great. Uh, so um... Thank you very much, Pat. That that's all very I'm really emotional now because I saw that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we often cry in our Lakota meetings, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. A lot of um... yeah, no, that uh, that's perfectly understandable. Um, I actually had a question, a, a suggestion, and a question. Um, I remember I was <laughs> I did my internship at the Milwaukee Public Museum mm -hmm. um, and I remember I worked very briefly with uh, Nancy Lurie, who was an anthropologist who worked um, primarily with Plains Indians mm -hmm. and she uh, she's no longer with us. She died in 2017. 
but I'm willing to bet that um, a lot of her uh, archives and research and um, uh, uh, there's probably like a ton of stuff in the archives at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And I still know Don Cher Tomei, who's the curator of collections there. So if you're doing research on the waistcoat, if you haven't contacted them yet, I'd be happy to put you in touch with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more like this style. And I mean, this, I, I did keep putting out, you know, call outs. It's actually on the website if anyone can find a picture uh, or some of, but they're going back anyway. I'm not going to research them so much um, because I'm not sure what they plan to do with them. I mean, they, uh, there's a suggestion that they'll bury everything. They're not really busy, you know. Um, so if anyone can handle that as museum workers, it was quite, uh, but that's, that's, you know, some objects can, some things should never have been in museums. And if they go back to their owners, they have to go, you know, that's, if we take up having taken away that fifth criterion of the fate of the object, if returned, then it's up to them. And if an object, if they feel that they, that's what they want to do. And I think the elders very much feel that way. Um, it's possible the ghost stand shirt no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anybody Jason else have a question? Yeah. or a comment or has anybody else well, my internet connection apparently is unstable so let's uh, hope not <laughs> um ruth de fresno guillem has a question um how did how did the owners feel about documentation um we will give all the documentation all our archives back to them so it depends um i have to say is that india was very much of the uh, <laughs> Catherine's raised her hand in a minute, Catherine. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. <laughs> right, so it depends. We haven't got that far with Nigeria, but this is what we always do, and we've done with human remains. I have done a lot of repatriations of human remains, and my feeling is that everything should be treated, if it's an ancestor or sacred, has to be treated the same way, so everything goes back. The Lakota, we, we're, sti we're still discussing it. We may not be allowed to keep anything. Once the objects are theirs, the records are theirs. And uh, so there's a discussion going on about with the Lakota in particular about how much we can keep and who makes that decision as well. Um, so a particular one, some of the elders are thinking that we might, uh, I would like to ask if we could maybe keep an image on the website of at least one of the objects as an illustration. So, um, we do keep, we will keep the register, Ruth, because um, the, the register isn't for just one or 25 objects, it's in years or blocks of years. So we'll have to keep the register. We haven't had, got that far with that, with that conversation. We haven't gone through itemizing everything, but we will have to keep the register because we'll lose a century's worth possibly, well, not a century, so that would be terrible. That would be like maybe two, two or three years of records. I can't, you know, each, each, because they're all handwritten, so it depends. So at least a couple of years of records if we have, if we can't keep, if we remove the registers and they're in lists, so we can't even tear the page out. So we'll have to, we'll have to bring that up. Thank you for bringing that up, actually, because we hadn't got to that point um, in the discussions. So that's going to be the hardest. Shall I answer Catherine? Catherine? Sure. Um, <laughs> hi, Pat. It's great to see you. Nothing haven't seen happy. you since Cape Town in March of 2020. Oh, this whole thing came out of, out of Cape Town. Me and you know, that's, that. It was a very stressful time. Right? As I, I, I remember being in Johannesburg on our way home and watching Trudeau on uh, CBC News on my son's laptop and Trudeau saying, come home now. And it's like, we're trying, <laughs> we're trying. Um, so it's great to see you. But uh, my, yeah, my question, I have two, I guess, comments. One is um, years ago, I went to the opening of an exhibition at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, um, which was about the Scots in Canada. And they had approached my mother when they were doing the research for that exhibition uh, because my great, great, great grandfather was one of the people featured in the exhibition. Um, but I just thought it was funny because so many of the objects in the exhibition had nothing to do with the Scots. It was all Métis stuff. Um, so that, that, that was sort of weird. I'm not sure how that works, but 
Um, I guess they were Scots Métis, so there you are. Um, my question is whether you have any Inuit stuff in the collection that you would consider repatriating. I'm now the director of planning for the new territorial um, heritage center that's being built in Ikalami. And um, we are it's in the planning stages and fundraising stages and hoping to be able to build in about five years. Um, so we would be starting that process of looking internationally for Inuit objects. Well, you could ask. I'm sure that there might be. We did have a request. Um, the whole the new repatriation working group came into being at exactly the time of COP26. And the head of the group, the new chair, was very excited by suddenly discovering A, they, they owned, he owned the collections, and B, he could do, and there was this repatriation going on. And he was a councillor who did not stand for re-election, but was looking to actually, you know, sort of improve his CV. And he stood up in the Indigenous Forum and actually said, you can, you have a small window of opportunity, you can never have all your stuff back. And I got an email via a number of managers saying, how much Indigenous stuff do you have? Exactly. And I think, well, what does that mean? And who's asking this question? So I heard this later from a Maori uh, activist. And of course, at events like that, you don't get people with with cultural authority. It's young climate activists. But we did, yes. Yeah. So we got two requests, one of which was from a girl who will remain nameless, but she was called Crystal. And <laughs> let's call her Sapphire. Uh, anyway, she purported to be to represent all Inuit all in, in, in Russia, uh, Alaska, Canada, wow. and Greenland. And I thought, and so our this head of the uh, the briefly uh, present head of the working group at the time was terribly excited by this, and uh, so I immediately thought, this who is going to pay for this? Um, if should it come off? So I sent everything to her and said, and um, heard nothing. Um, a lot of our material is little tiny bits of artwork, you know, these uh, little tiny toys and sculptures and games. But what you have to do if you're interested is send me an email and I will send you the list. Um, if you're interested or someone is interested, you have, I will also send you, you will have shortly the criteria sent to you if you take, if you download that link. And if, if, you can, if it would have to be someone of authority within the community. There's often disagreements within communities, so this is why we need one person or one group of people who are of like mind to come forward. Sure. The situation is proving to be quite complex because there's three competing claims, right? Yeah. Which, which is always something you think about, but I've never come across it in real life, you know. Right. Well, I, our project is being led by the um, the territorial Inuit organization and the three regional Inuit organizations. Um, and the Inuit Heritage Trust, which is the uh, an organization established through the Nunavut Agreement, and that's who I work for. So IHT is leading the project. So it's you know it's, they they have authority. <laughs> we're yeah, we're pretty serious that. Inuit creds, yeah. Well, you know, that's that's all we need. But we you, yeah. if you email me, I can send you a list of what we do have. Uh, okay. If there's anything of interest, I would not everything's been photographed. Um, so I would go back in and, and photograph. It's a, it's a process, but you come to sure. me first. This is if anyone else is going to claim, you have to come to me first, and then I pr uh, we work together um, to make a proposal, which will lead to a formal request. And I'm very supportive, but um, I no time wasters and um, and no allies. You know, as was the case of these, these two young people, one of whom the Maori claim went through a Maori ally. It's not person was actually Maori. And we do, this is a big issue, particularly in North, in Canada and North America, allies trying to help. And, yeah. uh, so quite, and people sort of, you know, for various reasons. But um, yeah, so I, I'll, but I can weed them people, you know, if you've got creds, it's no issue. But yeah. uh, with somebody, I would, you know, I would work with, I, I, I often you whittle down, it's often people to, that you, you eventually whittle down to, the people who want to step forward and take responsibility and go through the, you know, and, and be the person of authority that's got to work with the council, the Glasgow okay. City Council. But it's not, it's not, it's, um, it's not a problem. They were, they're very open at the moment, um, and I think they will continue to be open. But you, you know, you may not have anything in our collections that you. you know, sure, you well, it's, it's worth investigating. Um, and and another. <laughs> Sorry about the background noise here. Um, another project that I'm involved in is with 
uh, Rani Ansel at the University of Exeter, who's doing a project about repatriation and reconciliation on the Northwest coast of Canada. So I'm one of the international advisors to that project. Don't know if you've heard about it, but um, she just had her first workshop with um, all different First Nations throughout British Columbia. Mm -hmm. We were all together in Comox uh, two weeks ago. Um, and uh, I was the only one not from BC involved in this project, but all of these various First Nations are looking at what they are interested in repatriating. And they weren't talking yet about repatriating mm -hmm. from any specific places, but um, it'd be probably good to connect you with her as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, there are a lot of conversations. I often get people who are potentially interested and so I'm reflecting you know, So it's, it's a long process and there's lots of hiccups and issues that yeah. we have to iron out and try. I just try and make things it possible for people. And I also have, you know, so, but uh, I think, I think there are other questioners, Catherine. <laughs> um, do you want to just email me with all your questions and, mm -hmm. and I will send you lists of objects and that's the way to start. That's um, cost, is it something I should, if nobody else is doing this in this forum, cost, you know, a huge issue. Um, and um, so that always has to be considered um, because it's very hugely expensive to send, to send especially anything back really if you want to do it legally. Um, so um, I will say somebody actually came up and suggested that I handed them some objects. This was in, a, this is an official delegation, some of the smaller pieces so they could just take them away that day, but that is illegal. <laughs> because you have export licenses you know you have to consider all of these things transport you're, you're, you're not putting things in a little envelope or a, you know a bag um do i have a proper budget julia well that's what everybody should bring to the fore we do not have a proper budget the glasgow city council in their their final agreement agreed to help the lakota and so we're doing that, but uh, so we thought the Glasgow City Council would, that was very kind to them and they turned around and said, yes, you can do it. So the Lakota are being paid for out of um, our purchase fund, uh, which is a museum purchase fund. So that a lot of, and so some of the curators are slightly, have slightly gone off repatriation because of the fact that they can't acquire anything for the next year. People keep saying there should be something. Of course it should, it should be a central, like a grant or something. People will have to consider it. Uh, thank you, Gillian. But uh, yeah, there is no formal way of dealing with it. Nobody's really thought this through and this goes across the world. We've, I've, been, I've done other talks and brought people up um, and people have mentioned it, people from New Zealand and Australia who repatriate a lot, a lot of internal repatriations. You know, money is a big issue. I mean, a member of a human remains um, group of, of practitioners and uh, some of the uh, anatomy museums and the surgeons museums, they have to repatriate all the time. They have no money to do this, but no fund has yet been set up. So we're just having to deal with it. Um, India's paid for their own, Australia paid for its own human remains as returns and New Zealand tends to, to assist. Um, it's illegal. Well, it's illegal. Yeah, people might, I don't think our government considers whether something's illegal or not. <laughs> we just have to follow export laws. It's illegal to, to smuggle things out um, in general. And I don't think they can make it, they, it would be difficult to make an exception within law. What, no, no, no. Um, but also if you're going to smuggle something out, you still have the issue that it's an artwork or it's something that might be fragile and you want to pack it properly. And that involves other, other agencies as well. So there's lots of elements where, you know, we transport everything as the, you know, as a valuable work that it is and has to, it's not up to us to just shove things into an envelope and send them across, you know, to the recipient, we, everything gets treated, gets transported properly. Um, but we do have laws. Yeah, yes, exactly. What was um, from Hilliard? Um, yeah, repatriation can't be free because it's all part, it's, it, it could be free if it was, if we were, if our government was a museum, but it's not, you know, they have to follow the laws of the land and that's the way it is. Um, 
that so we have a you know for that antiquities have to have a life an export license. That's so that because it works both ways, it could still be smuggled out, and that does happen. Um, you know, sort of also in in the states. You know, there was there were cases recently. But lots of things still get stolen, sacred objects, particularly from the pueblos, which are open, and they're taken and be and smuggled out to the states. So that you know, it's and so we have laws to protect also not just repatriation, but um, for to protect things from being smuggled out, stolen and smuggled out as well. So um, it's not you know it's it is hugely expensive for us. But India offered to pay, um, so we accepted that. I have no pride here, so if they offered to pay, that's fine, because in fact it wasn't the original communities in that case, it was another government. But yes, I mean, it's, there's just so many costs if you want to treat the objects properly and give them the respect they deserve, um, because they do deserve it. And if they're ancestors, you know, we're transporting people and their souls. So that's, you know, they have to be treated specially. That's how I feel. I'm only, I am, however, I do not have a budget at all. I'm a curator. So it's not my decision to make, really. Um, are, there, are there any more questions, Elke? I'm not actually going into the chat here. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I did want to also mention and put in a plug for the new uh, Canadian Museums Association um, report, which TRC report, which just came out. Uh, it came out publicly yesterday. It's called Museums Move to Action. Advancing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Call to Action number 67. Um, and um, it's calling for support for Indigenous led organizations, initiatives, and self determination at every level of museum operations and within all museum positions across the country. It's about activating UNDRIP in museums in Canada. And um, it's been uh, created by the CMA over five years with funding from Department of Canadian Heritage, makes 10 recommendations and provides a toolkit. Um, and among the recommendations are calls for more financial support for Indigenous cultural centres and Indigenous-led national heritage organisations, particularly to support re repatriations. Um, and then, of course, a, new, a national museum policy and museums assistance program that actually supports um, UNDRIP uh, as it's being imp implemented in museums. So um, I thought you all should know about that. Uh, it just came out um, and the museum community is very, very excited about it. Yeah. So uh, somebody I'm excited that. about it. Somebody yeah. said that literally as I was about to start, um, so I haven't looked at it yet, but I think there is talk, but no action so far. So Museum Gallery Scotland, who have been funding um, posts, actually uh, um, staff posts in various museums on decolonization and, and uh, transatlantic slavery. So, you know, I feel that uh, actually, you know, they should, need, they should consider this maybe. Museums Association in here in the UK should also consider it maybe. Um, uh, there, you know, there, are, there is talk, um, but no action so far, because we are, I have to say, we're the first, we were the first, we will be the first institution in the UK to have returned anything at all to India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing else has gone back. Three, some three objects from private collections have gone back, but nothing else. Um, we're, you know, um, there are other moves to repatriate to Ben in, but I don't know where that funding's coming from. I think quite there'll be quite a lot of they have a little breathing space, which is good for um, publicity, and you know, and ethics, and our sense of moral justice. But that's because in Nigeria they don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to for for to house everything, and so they have got a long term plan, and so it looks like we would keep material for quite some time. And the head of the NCMM is aware of the other problem. One of the other problems is that the um, diaspora Nigerian community and other diaspora communities where there is one, you know, they sometimes feel bereft. They feel they're going to lose something. Although he did point out that young Nigerians um, in Nigeria have never seen any of the Benin material. So it's time to share, but he has his sort of opinion that you don't want to take, well, to take everything back would mean that the many Nigerians and young Nigerians definitely might not see everything, anything. But having said that, the nationals are not going to return anything at all. 
none of the national museums are, are going to be repatriating a great deal, not truly repatriating. So the, I, I don't think diaspora Nigerians need to worry. The British Museum will always have the full complement of any material. <laughs> so it's, there's a law that was introduced in, in the 1980s, I think, to try and prevent re, that what looked like go, was going to be a great exodus from the National Museums in Britain. And so it's now, the National Museums are not allowed to repatriate by law. Uh, that would be Victoria and Albert, British Museum, National Museum of Scotland and Liverpool. So they're all national museums and, they can, and by law they're not, and nobody, and they don't seem to be inclined to try to overturn that law. So, so we're separate from them. Those, those laws do not apply to us and also at all. And we're also under Scots law. So when people say, what about other museums in the UK? It does depend on their governance. Um, so I can't say that I'm not criticizing or even competing with other museums. They all have, because if they're not doing it, it's because they can't, or maybe either because of a law like that or because the governing bodies are against it. Dusty Elgin marbles or the Parthenon marbles as people in Greece like to call them, um, Hilliard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's just one example, though, that's everything, you know, and that is an argument, the Universal Art Museum argument still kind of trickles on, but of course, you know, uh, when you look at people, you know, somebody asked why, why just send things back to India as opposed to try to make, you know, to try by very best to locate the original owners or the descendants. And uh, which, of course, I'm still doing, but, you know, it's easier for someone in Bihar to go to Delhi than it is for them to get a visa to come to Britain. So if they want to see that steli that we're sending back, um, they can do it far more easily from where they live. And this is a big problem, of course, if you do keep objects from other parts of the world. Yes, you know, if you return them, yes, some diaspora, be, um, young diaspora sort of people might, or community members might lose immediate access, but they're far more likely to be able to get to go home to Nigeria to the, or the, to, to, to Nigeria, I'm just using, I'll continue to use that example, then a young Nigerian with no visa would be to come over to Britain to look at them, these objects, and where there's in the first place. So I don't think, I think this is sort of a slightly redundant argument, but people keep making it. Yep, <laughs> that is true. Um, so we are seven minutes past the end of our webinar. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Um, or comments that they wish to make? I would just um, comment that um, actually the argument of exposure and ability of the public to uh, see and appreciate and have interpreted artworks has come into play also uh, with Central American uh, art, uh, where uh, there are potentially thousands of pieces uh, in storage areas <laughs> that are, are totally inaccurate. Uh, inadequate uh, facilities ranging from Mexico to Peru. Uh, at the same time, of course, the obvious moral argument of return. And then the question becomes, do you do a partial return and arrange, try to arrange a partial return and partial uh, uh, indefinite loan policy or something of that sort? Yeah, I mean, answer, yeah. I'm just pointing out. Well, yes, it is something I consider, but the idea of having things on loan from them actually transferring the ownership is one way of looking at it. We do that. I do work a lot with people who just can't take things back because they don't want, you know, obviously with the Lakota, they they want to bury everything. They don't want these aren't museum objects. So put that aside. If they want to keep them as museum objects, yeah, I work with the Torres Strait Islanders in the Pacific, and we have these two three meter tall poles that are sacred. There's like there is friction within the community because the particular ancestor was quite bloodthirsty, but also they wanted them back. They don't have the facility. You know, they don't have a building tall enough to hold them. So, um, so at the moment, you know, that's not happening. But um, so, but we've come to an agreement or we're trying um, one agreement, we may come to other agreements. So it's, you know, every case is different and not everybody wants things back and not everybody, any community can have things back, but there may be other solutions. In the case of Torres Strait, they, um, what they wanted was a display. It was an archeological excavation around this ancestor and they wanted a display and they asked if we could, they, could, we, they, didn't, want the, they didn't want the post back because the nearest museum capable of housing them was eight hours away by plane. 
Yeah. So what, what they asked for was very high resolution images, 360, so that they could use them any way they liked, which, so we, we did that. And what they did was they made little tiny models to sell in their, oh. yeah, in their gift shop thing that they had associated with their. We've so had awesome. with the full range in Montreal. Um, I'm now retired, I should point out, as of a few months ago, but uh, uh, ranging from uh, obviously the issue of Nazi repatriation and we uh, all the all these objects were uh, rep uh, well, there were only a couple, but they were repatriated to a Maori head uh that uh had come very early in the museum's history and uh and it was re it was given back with a full ceremony and that sort of thing so we all may face this in rather diverse ways uh sometimes quite unexpected uh to the collection itself i think if you've got a bit if you're you know like a lot of us here i guess we're sort of have a very broad remit you're covering the entire world you have to be quite able to you know, realize, and you do realize that there are so many different situations, so many issues. You're dealing with living people, dead people, living artists, dead artists, many different systems of belief, and many, you know, and there is a different solution to everyone, and sometimes there's no solution. That's what I said. That's it's right. really, it's so complicated. <laughs> That's you know? true. And uh, each case has to be taken individually um, and looked at from all sides. But the main thing is to reach out and to keep the door open, I think, for discussion, not close the door in anticipation of some, I think the floodgates, if anybody uses that term again. <laughs> <laughs> the floodgates, the the floodgates, floodgates will open, I get that all. But, you know, just keeping the door open for discussion and working towards the best solution, if you can. Um, and somebody, we had a meeting, I had a meeting with Neil Curtis from Aberdeen the other week. We were trying to soften up the Scottish archaeologists and our team. And he said, you know, actually, claimant, although a lot of the terms you use are quite sort of harsh, quite legalistic. And he's thinking it's more of a discussion. It's more like putting, putting together a proposal as, you know, working together, you know, all parties working together and putting that forward as a proposal as opposed to a claim. And, uh, and I thought well, soft, that's an interesting approach. And I, and I'm, yeah, and I quite like that sometimes. It's not always the case because that within India, it was going to be, it was very good. It's going to be very, uh, jargonistic and in, in bureaucratic terms you know it's coming from two national governments trying to cut you know nothing nobody in the whole of that process who've been in India actually until very, actually showed any interest in the objects themselves for a very long time right so that that's another whole different uh, issue but everyone is different and you just have to kind of and everyone has a different solution you hope but if you work hard enough over and work with enough people that care, then you know we can we can usually come up with something. And sometimes that's repatriation, sometimes it's not. And and I'm going to plug my next talk in two weeks' time, which I haven't <laughs> yet got the link up, which is actually working talking with someone on my on, on staff who um has a situation with an object. She's from Zimbabwe. There's an object in our collection that belonged to the last king of her particular tribe, and she doesn't want it to go back. Oh. And she's been to Zimbabwe and talked about it with people there for various reasons. So she and I are going to have a discussion. I'm not going to have an argument because we'd have a discussion because it, it's a point of view I think is very important. It, um, and I'm, you know, so uh, so that'll be, I haven't quite got the time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, um, Pat. Uh, I will send, I will send, send, out, I'll send out that link. You can, you know, it will be on Zoom and it'll be in, it's yeah. on a Tuesday. I know the date. I'm, I think it's 7, or 7.30 in the, in the UK. But, send it um, to us and we will send it to everybody on yeah. uh, this um, webinar. Yeah. And uh, I, I think we really have to end now because it is for almost 4.15. Um, thank you so much, Pat. Uh, that was an amazing talk. And um, I'm so happy that uh, we had so many people on the webinar. And um, thank you all for coming. And um, we'll talk again soon. I, uh, you know, I, I think really in the end, it's all about respect. Yes, I agree. Yeah, respect and That's caring. True. And you have to do it from your heart. Yeah, it's not quite in doing just in engaging only the frontal lobe. You need to do it from your heart, um, and you just need to remember that the people that we're working with are are people. They're descendant from other people, and quite often we've got their ancestors involved because so that everybody involved, is, you know, is human. 
and we're all human so yeah we just all you know it's a lot of caring mm -hmm. um, so it was a pleasure thank you icon canada <laughs> <laughs> first time i've ever spoken to icon canada <laughs> wonderful thank you very yeah, thanks much. very much for inviting right. me okay. bye everybody Bye.